COVID-19 tips sponsored by Dead Soap. One, practice social distancing. Two, wear your mask when leaving the house. Three, wash your hands regularly for 20 seconds using our Dex Soap. Four, cover your nose and mouth with a disposable tissue or flex elbow when you cough or sneeze. Choose Dex Soap for that extra cleanliness. Dex Soap is affordable and available nationwide. Ninety now is 51 in Guyana and right across the Eastern Caribbean. Guys, we do really apologize for the late start in Route 592 this evening. Of course, you know, technology will fail us at times. There's nothing we can do. It's beyond our control. We had some technical difficulties uh, in studio here. However, thank you so much to the... Uh, Internet providers, it was able to be rectified, and hence we head straight into tonight's program. Of course, your host for tonight is Dr. Yog Mahadio, and he's joined by his co-host, senior journalist, Leonard Gildari. Dr. Mahadio, Leonard, good evening to you. Once again, I do apologize for the late start. I owe you one. Thank you very much, sir. Yog, you, you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Not seeing you, but we hear you. Wonderful. Well, good evening to you, Leonard. Good evening, Joshua Van Sleitman and the entire team at Kaito Radio. Indeed, Joshua, Raj, and Kevin, you owe us all. And I don't know if they would ever be able to repay this debt, Leonard. They owe all the viewers that's been waiting patiently. And of course, Senior Counsel, Mr. Ralph Ram Karan, and our brother, Oren Gordon, and Peter Wickham. Uh, these boys owe a big debt tonight for giving us some technical <laughs> issues. So, ladies and gentlemen, all across Guyana, welcome to Room 592, where we unleash the truth. Let me apologize once again for our late start. It has to do with some uh, internet downtime beyond our control, but we are now ready to rock and roll tonight, as we would have said many years ago. I don't know what the youngsters say nowadays. It's definitely not rock and roll, right, Or <laughs> <laughs> Welcome once again to this wonderful program of ours where we unleash the truth. And let me remind you, as we get going with our tonight's discussion, and just before I welcome our guests, our panelists online here, let me tell you all, ladies and gentlemen, that once again, once again, there has been perversion taking place. Once again, a report has not been submitted. Once again, we have the ball kicked down the road, so to speak. And now GCOM are meeting tomorrow to reach the sixth iteration, sixth edition, sixth version, whatever you want to call it, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Cheat Lowenfield has prepared six copies of a report and none of, none of them reconcile with the other. And so, ladies and gentlemen, when I use the words like Department of Political Information, and Mr. Chief Lowenfield, please, I wish to assure you that is ascribed to me personally and my guests and this radio station do not bear any liability for those words. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start this program again tonight by telling you that this evening we would have received word that no other than uh, the head of the OAS the chair of the Permanent Council of the OAS has been written to by the Secretary General and his short letter, the short letter from the Secretary General reads as follows. I quote, I have the honor of addressing your excellency to request your support in calling a meeting of the Permanent Council to deal with the situation of the electoral process in Guyana. Availing myself of this opportunity to reassure you of my highest consideration, I remain Louis Almagro, Secretary General. So ladies and gentlemen, all across the world, whether we accept it or not, Guyana is making some waves, waves like we would not wish upon ourselves or upon any other nation. And let me also say this to you, St. Kitts, Nevis, Suriname, and now Trinidad is coming up with her general election. 
everybody has held their general elections after us, and they have declared the results before us. 133 days and counting, ladies and gentlemen. And on that note, then, let me welcome our guests here tonight. Uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome senior counsel, Mr. Ralph Ramkran, to our room 592. He is no stranger to this room, having been here before. Senior, welcome once again, and it's good to have you and your stage counsel here with us tonight because we certainly have some questions for you. Let me also welcome our brother, Guyanese born, but resident of Trinidad and Tobago. We got to make him come home very soon. Mr. Oren Gordon, former BBC correspondent, former ACCA personnel. He has worked with the Association of Chartered Accountants. And so he is a consultant in PR and political matters. And of course, Oren, you have been here before. I no need to welcome you again, my brother. You know that you are welcome in room 592. And brothers and sisters, finally, our special guest also for tonight, Mr. Peter Wickham, renowned political scientist who uh, has been operating out of many countries in the Caribbean, but his name is well known to a lot of persons in and out of, of Guyana and certainly around the world. He is joining us from France today. And so if you see a little boo-boo in Mr. Peter Wickham's eyes, don't mind it <laughs> because it is six hours behind our time here now. Peter, welcome to our show, my brother. Welcome to Room 592. So ladies and gentlemen, as we welcome our panelists, I would like to first start by putting the ball in senior counsel's court Senior, this afternoon, we all know what transpired at GCOM. That's one. Number two, this afternoon, Commissioner Vincent Alexander would have still held on to that tendril, to that thread, that somehow or the other in APNU AFC's mind, the CCJ's decision negated the entire account. Senior, just before you answer, we had Mr. Anthony Astefan, senior counsel from the OECS countries here in room 592 last week. And he dealt with that paragraph 52. But it seems like the message has not gone home. So, sir, can you please assure the Guyanese public whether there is any shred of doubt with regards to the, 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 the importance of Order 60 of GCOM to have this recount done and, of course, the prevailing nature of the recount numbers? Over to you, senior. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, good evening to your viewers. The Order 60 was extensively reviewed in the decision of the CCG, and it, it was a, a reviewed with approval. Uh, they set out in detail what the order said and what it meant, and there was no statement of any sort that disapproved the order. There was some attempt locally here in Guyana to say that the order was in tension with the Constitution, was in conflict with the Constitution. The CCJ said no such thing. What they said is that the order could not change the Constitution. But that was said within a context and the context was that Justice Reynolds said in his decision that Order 60 created a new regime, a new elections regime. Well, both lawyers and laymen know very well that subsidiary legislation cannot alter principal legislation. They are enabling subsidiary legislation. That is, they enable the efficacy of the principal legislation. They facilitate it. They make it more, uh, more easily to implement. Right. So they just made a statement to the effect that, as is well known, the order did not alter mm -hmm. the constitutional arrangements for elections. That's all they did. But right. they reviewed the order with great with approval. Mm -hmm. So, Sina, why would why would APNU AFC? I mean, I'm asking you to probably sit in their minds, which is impossible. But why would they still 
you know, raise this up as a public concern as Mr. Alexander did this evening coming out of the GCOM meeting that he still feels that the CCJ decision put aside the entire recount. Why do you think there is, they're still holding on to this? Well, they're holding on to that to justify the behavior of Lowenfield and uh, his enablers, who are the, the, the government people. Um, mm -hmm. And they have nothing else to hold on to. They, yes. All they can do is pluck sentences out of the decision of the CCG and, uh, and, 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 and use it to justify what Lowenfield is saying, is doing. They didn't pluck out the statement that Lowenfield's act in mm -hmm. uh, disenfranchising 115,000 people was totally and absolutely condemned. Now, you can't have a condemnation of that by the CCJ on a statement that Mr. Harmon's um, complaints have to be decided by election an election petition after mm -hmm. the results have been declared. And at the same time, the CCJ uh, disapproved or rejected the recount, recount results. I mean, the two things don't go together. It's either one or the other. Right. So thank you for that, Council. Um, Oren, I want to come to you next with the following. Um, the last time we spoke, Oren, uh, in Room 592, I would have, we would have discussed some of this, that at the time of the recount, the first set of declarations were not discarded. They were still held in place. I think the chairman would have said that those declarations would stand until replaced. However, as of today's meeting, it is clear that the chairman has said that all those 10 declarations are now behind us, put aside, set aside is her words. And so that paves, uh, leaves no ambiguity for uh, using the, the, the data from the recount. That being said, Oren, what's your thoughts on, in terms of what you would have seen transpired yesterday, today, and your, your fingers on the pulse from a Trinidadian perspective, sir? From a Trinidadian perspective, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, formulation. Um, good evening to my fellow panelists. I am slightly intimidated by their brilliance, but I will try to do my best uh, tonight. Um, I think one of the, one of the most significant things, I will leave the legal references mm -hmm. to my learned friend, Senior Counsel Ram Karan, and I will try to express it in clear layman's language. I think one of the interesting things that the, the, the CCJ did was to, was to state that the determination of valid votes lay within the recount mechanism. And so you can't, as a chief elections officer, arbitrarily, without explanation, and without, as my old math teacher used to say, showing me the, showing me the homework, you can't impose your own arbitrary standards of what constitutes a recount. What the CCJ was very careful to do was to establish the legal tram lines within which Mr. Lowenfield was compelled to uh, operate. And so what happens by his not doing that, and, and this is a point I don't hear discussed that much, he's actually breaking the law perhaps willfully breaking the law. And that is, that is a problem. Mm -hmm. Holding him to account for breaking the law is, 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 is obviously a difficult thing to do in the, atmos in, the, in the atmosphere of political uncertainty that currently prevails. But right. here is somebody who is actually willfully breaking the law and and and, and that is a problem the, there, there's no ambiguity in my mind i'm not a lawyer but there's no ambiguity in my mind about how the ccj ruled and the direction in which they sought to take things but i think the beauty of this ruling like the last ruling on on what constituted an absolute majority and what didn't 
the court resisted the temptation to overreach. The court resisted the temptation to engage in judicial activism by placing orders. It says, here's the framework. This is what the law says. Please be clear on what the law says. And now I expect you as big boys and girls to sort out your own problems. And that, and that is my take on, on, on what has happened, not just, as you said, in, in the past few days, but in the past couple of weeks or so. All right. Thank you for that, Oren. And Peter, I'm coming to you, sir. Um, Peter, you are a lecturer. You have been, sorry. Previously, you were a lecturer at the University of West Indies, lecturing courses on international politics. What would you be telling <laughs> your students after 133 days of an election? Mm -hmm. What would you say? <laughs> I mean, I would, I, I would tell her this is not supposed to happen. Um, yeah, I wanted to say a couple of things that were a little bit different tonight. And one, one relates to this whole question of legitimacy, which is consistent with this whole IR uh, perspective that I used to articulate. And, you know, we always argue that sovereignty is an internal thing and that it comes from within. But legitimacy ultimately comes from outside. Um, when a country declares its sovereignty and it says, you know, I'm a nation, first thing it does is it looks to the United Nations to see which is the first country or set of countries that will acknowledge and will say, okay, this is a legitimate country. And, and, and this is where I have a challenge. I, I have some, um, I, I'm not understanding how could after all this time and after the condemnation that has come from so many different quarters, um, President Granger actually think that he could assume office and he could govern as normal, you know, within the context of CARICOM, within the context of the Commonwealth, that he could go to the United Nations and he could speak, even though um, pretty much I have not heard a single country other than Guyana that has, well, people in Guyana that has said that they are comfortable with what is happening there. And, and that is something that fascinates me, that after all this time, he's actually still willing to go along with it because he believes that you know, GCOM can declare tomorrow that he's president and that he can uh, can continue uh, and go on as normal. It would be very, very difficult for him to govern Guyana internally, far less to establish relationships with his brothers and sisters across the world. Because the, the reality of the situation is that I struggle in this to find anyone other than a person who supports the APNU AFC, either locally or abroad, that, that actually agrees that this is the right thing to do. Um, and this is why I keep saying, you know, Hillary Beckles was the most recent person that came out. He's been savage. Prime Minister Motley came out. She was savage. I mean, she was almost a national hero a few weeks ago. Uh, Prime Minister Gonzalez, he came out and he's been savage. Of course, me being savage is nothing new because I always get attacked, you know, whenever I do these <laughs> polls. But it has been a, a slew of people who have been attacked the OAS, everyone, and, and it is as though everyone that, has, that automatically becomes evil overnight, you become evil by suggesting anything other than that lane. But the other more important thing I want to, to raise tonight, though, is, is, is this idea that the question of breaking the law, as, as um, a colleague just said quite rightly, um, I think that these guys know. Um, when election night or the night of the count, when Mingo uh, started to do this fancy footwork with Region 10 data, I think that he understood that he was breaking the law. And I would say that it's no different to what Yasim Abubakar did when he stormed the Red House in Trinidad and Tobago in 1990. It's a coup. Mm -hmm. The thing with a coup is that once you start a coup, you don't, you don't back down. Because ultimately, when you start that process, you know, the only thing that can end it is, is, is death in, in the case of what Bakar did. And ultimately, Guyana is under siege. And I think that the siege that Guyana is under for the last 100 days is no different to the siege that um, Yasim Abu Bakar held Trinidad and Tobago in for those few days back in 1990. The question is, how do you get out of this siege? Or how do you get to a situation where you can move back to normalcy? Um, in the case of Ab Abu Bakar, it took a... Um, it took a, a um, basically an amnesty mm -hmm. that was offered. And, and my suggestion is that this is very well the stage that you may have to come to know, because I don't think these guys are going to back down. The reality of the situation is that if the government changes in Ghana tomorrow, and you, you make Dr. Infran Ali president of Ghana, these guys know that they're going to prison, and they're going to prison for a long time, because, of course, they broke the law. Um, th there's really very little justification for it. But the reason that we're seeing them digging their heels more and more is because they understand the consequences are going to be devastating for them. 
Uh, the con consequences for the PNC are going to be politically devastating, but these two guys particularly, because they're the two ones who are exposed, have to pay uh, a dear price for this. And my feeling is that the time has come where some diplomatic back channel needs to be established to see whether or not there is a possibility that some kind of amnesty arrangement can be adhered to. Um, these guys can be assured that they will not leave uh, office and walk into prison. And, and then hopefully the situation can be resolved because my feeling is that they're going to go to court sooner rather than later if they don't get what they expect tomorrow. I suspect that if they feel that he will be pressured to make a particular statement, they're going to go to court and they're going to block the process. Um, in the case of Guyana, I've noticed a difference between the types of judgments that you're seeing at the local level and the types of judgment that you're seeing at the CCJ. The thing is that it's going to take a while to get there, and it is possible that they will get some kind of a judgment at the local level, either from the High Court or from the Appeal Court, that may very well slow down this process and may keep you at bay for another few weeks. So I agree with everything that I've said, I've heard today. Yes, I think that, you know, um, the, the law is on your side. And I think that you guys have been quite patient, quite frankly, because you have been dealing with this for a long time, you know, and your supporters have been, been relatively well behaved. But I think it's come to the point now where there needs to be some kind of diplomatic back, back channel. Because I don't believe that any of these guys realize or, or think that they're doing something that's right. The supporters do. But I think that, you know, the thinkers in there, they're, they're right now, it's, they're under siege and, and they're acting in a way. And my feeling is that that's really the only resolution that we can come to at this stage. Interesting. Already if, wanted to, yeah, yeah, I just mm -hmm. wanted to jump in and, and, and address mm -hmm. something that Peter said. Mia Motley's intervention, along with that of her CARICOM colleagues in getting the parties to agree to a recount, mm -hmm. Peter, that was a diplomatic back channel. <laughs> because what she did, in effect, was to offer mm -hmm. President Granger, who by then everybody knew had lost the election, what she did, in effect, was to offer him an elegant off-ramp, and he didn't take it. Mm -hmm. Which, which the CCJ did two days ago too, to offer them, but, you know, yes, go on. No, not, not really, because when, when Prime Minister Motley came in, if the recount had essentially confirmed what we believe to have been the case, um, those two guys are still exposed because ultimately uh, Mingo has still committed a fraud All right. and Lowen Field has still supported that. And, and that's my thing. So I, I get your point, Arinda. I think it gave, it gave us a perfect opportunity, as you said, to take an off-ramp. But that off round would still have exposed those two people. Criminal yeah. charges weren't filed yet, but I think that they understood where, where they were going with all of this. So um, I, I respectfully disagree that it, it still would have left the two of them exposed. So, gotcha. yeah. so interesting. Uh, Councilor uh, Senior, I want to bring you in here because there are two things then that, that uh, we need to think of. Peter's position is that you know some kind of discussion needs to happen and 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 it, you know mr gildari and yours truly today on radio um we were talking about one of these paradigm senior we were saying that low and feel is going to continue to do this over and over because he thinks that the only way he'll get off is by presidential pardon and there is only one president that will pardon him because he will be taken to court by the citizens of this country so council could that be one of the areas that needs to be worked on from an international geopolitical perspective? And the second point, one of our viewers has sent a question to you, Council. Is there a likelihood that the chairman of GCOM can be removed by the president on some Article 225 removal of the chairman for misbehavior, quote unquote? Is there a likelihood of that, uh, Senior Council? You're muted, sir. Please unmute your mic. Yes. To, to deal with the second one first, it's very difficult to remove a member of a, of a constitutional commission. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to have a complaint, and then that complaint has to be reach the prime minister, and then the prime minister has to appoint a committee or a commission to investigate it, there's a trial. So it's a very, very long procedure. So the simple answer is no, it's not an easy task. And, and the chairman hasn't done anything, in my mind, in my view, to um, justify such 
a radical step. In relation to the potential charges against the election officials, the Guyana situation here is extremely tense ethnically. It, the tension is not demonstrated or is not felt uh, physically as you go about your normal business, COVID-19 um, accepting. But the politicians are very much aware of the ethnic tension that can blow up at any moment. Yeah. or the ethnic tension that surrounds politics. And while the APNU did not show the same kind of uh, sentiments when they were appointed, when they were elected in 2015, the PPP demonstrated a great uh, deal of uh, reluctance in 1992 to challenge anyone who was involved in any skullduggery, elections, problem, corruption, and all of that. And there were many people, and they were known. I mean, we know the fellows used to tell us how they rigged the ballot boxes. I mean, you know, he, he, he's dead now, but um, Robert, um, Robert Williams, mm -hmm. the, um, the deputy mayor of the city of Georgetown was a very active PNC member. I was I sat with him on the elections commission uh, for quite a while, and he used to tell us uh, what they did. So these guys were well known, and nothing happened. And I think that they, I'm not in touch with the leadership of the PPP, and I have no discourses with them. But from the statements made by Irfan Ali, and what I know to be their general approach, it is unlikely that they will want to engage in any um, pursuit, legal pursuit of people who have been involved in election malpractice, notwithstanding the very great deal of passion against um, these guys. Now, okay. from the perspective of the opposition, Mingo and Lowenfield are regarded as criminals. From the perspective of the APNO people, Mingo and Lowenfield are regarded as heroes. Mm. So you have a very big problem there. And I don't think that we will, if this succeed, if, if the chairman eventually comes through and the proper election results are declared and the president sworn in and so on, uh, uh, peace, peaceably, peacefully. I don't think there's going to be any um, issue of court action, criminal right. charges, and that but kind of thing. Here, here is another paradigm. And Peter, I want to bring this at you. Mm -hmm. um, here is another paradigm. These are not the 70s, 80s, not even the 90s. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. even, you know, and now... A lot of things are happening that is outside of the control of the old guard politicians that felt mm -hmm. that the leaders, you know, the leader will have the final say. I tell you, a lot of Guyanese people may not want to let this go. And the law, the courts are going to be and will be accessible to the people of this country. So, Peter, you might very well have another movement that may be starting. Because Guyanese may feel, can we ever allow this to happen again? And if you don't deal with the perpetrators, you are inviting its recurrence. Over yeah. to you. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, as you're speaking, I'm reading some of the comments on on um, on YouTube from supporters that are of the opinion that these guys need to be locked up. And and, and I think that. The general feeling on the ground from PPP supporters is, is one of anger, uh, and, and I agree certainly with um, with um, Senior Counsel Rangkaran's assessment that you know they, they 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 are heroes to the APNU people and they're villains to the PPP civic people. Um, I do not think that there is a tolerance now for the level of corruption that we would have seen in the past. I mean, we we know the history of Guyana where um, election fancy footwork is concerned. You know, we know of um, 
Balapak stuff in and, and there's a history associated with it. I don't need to repeat right. that. And, and you know, you know who would have been responsible. But my feeling is that you could do that any time when there were no um, cell phones, there were no recordings. I mean, half of those statement and polls that are knocking around is because somebody, you know, photographed it on their phone and their copies of it knocking around. So that when Mingo stands up and reads something that is patently false, it's harder to, to, to get away from that. So in, in response, I do feel that those guys are, they appreciate that they will be pursued legally. Um, in the way that in the 1990s you turned a blind eye, honestly, I think that they will be pursued and I think that they understand that. And I do feel that this is an environment where technology and the way, I mean, this, thing, this, this recon was done in broad daylight. You know, um, people were sitting in the room when they saw one person leave and come back with a spreadsheet. So the, 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 the tolerance for that type of thing now is no longer there. And I feel that there will be almost an obligation to pursue these guys legally, unless, of course, there is some instrument that's available, uh, like an amnesty that would say a presidential pardon and say to them, you know, that um, they will not be pursued. And my, my feeling is that, you know, you, you always want in a situation like this to punish someone. And I appreciate that certainly for supporters of the, the, the PPP Civic, you would like to see someone dragged before the courts and locked up for a long time. But you also have to weigh the two things. If, if an amnesty would be a victory for the PNC side or for the APNU side, and you can allow them to claim victory while you get on with the business of running the government at these things, I, I would see it as a win-win. Because as long as you define it for them as a zero-sum game, they're, they're never going to let go. And as I said, there, there are many more court options that they can pursue, and they can keep you guys at bay for, for a lot longer. In the meantime, the, the, the horse is starving, you know, uh, and that, that is the concern I have that it's making Guyana look quite bad in the international community. Um, the government is already saying that they're going to run out of money, and I think that's going to create all kinds of problems on the ground for, for the average man or woman. And, and yeah, no, so maybe that might be something to consider. Correct. Well, interesting, and, and thank you for those um, points, because it is, it is, ladies and gentlemen, it is important that we be cognizant of these factors, because if a set of persons are operating out of fear of prosecution, and, you know, somebody could extend an olive branch, so to speak, then it might do us all well. Uh, Oren, the Caribbean and, and, and Guyana and, and all of our people, um, my brother, the issue here, going back to what Peter said and what Senior said, the issue here is that the APNU AFC, a lot of the players of the APNU AFC that, that uh, one could say has been aiding and abetting what's going on, they have been there in the 80s. They were part of the 80s dynamics. And going back to what senior counsel said, and Peter, I'll raise this back with you again. I need to address this thing. Um, because, or in, in the 1980s, as senior said, coming to 1992 elections, everybody agreed, let's let bygones be bygones and let's forget about it. But here is where we are in 2020, smack into the center of 1980s. You know, if it weren't for Claudette Singh, can you imagine if the president had his way? And his unilateral appointee, Patterson, was the chairman of GCOM. What would have been the state of this country today? Well, the international community would have reacted in, in exactly the same way as they are reacting now, because mm -hmm. they were able to see through all of the ploys, all of the shenanigans, which, as Peter said, some of which, as Peter said, occurred in plain sight. But the, but, the, the well, question... Sorry to inter interject into your thoughts, but, but hold on. On the 6th of March, Patterson would have declared these elections. So that would have been before the international community got riled up. It would have just been at the helm, at the cusp of things, declaration gone, and they would say go to court. So the winner would have had to go to take the loser to court for having won the election. But this, this is in the realm of speculation. What could Mr. Patterson have done, Justice Patterson have done, about the fact that the uh, PPPC garnered more votes than the coalition? Well, it, would, it would have played out in exactly the same way, I presume. I, again, we're in the realm of speculation. With the spreadsheet, what he had the power to do, though, was to enforce the... Um, 
the institutional irregularities in favor of the ruling party. But again, as we say in Guyana, uh, Dr. Mahadio, you run from the jumbi and you put up with the coffin. The, the, the same thing, as far as, as far as the international community is concerned, the same thing would have played out because the numbers don't lie. Presumably, and again, we're in the realm of speculation, presumably the numbers would have been the same. And the numbers are what drive this process. Elections, to, to some degree, they're, they're a qualitative exercise when it comes to voters making the choice. But in the end, they are mainly a quantitative exercise. And as far as the quantitative element is concerned, the numbers didn't lie. I want to touch on a point that senior counsel raised about what happened in the 1992 election and a determination by the then administration of Chedi Jagan that they weren't going to pursue people in the courts who had been involved in election manipulation. The difference is that that was an institutionalized process going back decades. And, 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 and so there was that. And the, the other thing was, I, I, it is my view that what is going on now is far more blatant and egregious and in your face than that which has been practiced. Because as Peter said, the technology of today puts everything in the spotlight, puts everything in your face. And the fact that you are trying to bulldoze your way through the technology you, you are trying to give light to what video cameras are saying right. is, 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 is a totally different kettle of fish and a totally different set of facts. But I have to ask a question in, in, in ending this response. I have to ask a question. If you are going to telegraph before the fact that you are not going to pursue the players, you're not going to hold people accountable uh, in this process, where is the deterrence? You know, <laughs> what is going to stop yeah. the what, what is going to stop the, the, the chief elections officer from defying the chairman yet again, even though she's narrowed the space legally in, in which he has to operate? What's going to stop him from defying her again, from as I said at the beginning, mm -hmm. from breaking the law? Because the legal tram lines established by the Caribbean Court of Justice were pretty, were pretty clear. Peter, you want to take that one? <laughs> no, I mean, it's a, it's a reasonable point. Um, even if he's offered an amnesty, he could continue to pursue it. But, you know, it just depends on the way the negotiations happen. Um, let's say, for example, the amnesty speaks to prosecution being impossible within the context of an unfinished election petition which basically okay. means that before anyone can be prosecuted, the election petition has to be completed and has to make specific conclusions. In a sense, that puts him on the spot and he may be comfortable with that. Um, mm -hmm. The alternative is that you can say that the, the amnesty only kicks in at the point in time when he agrees to, um, you know, to essentially sign the correct report. And if, if he doesn't want to sign the correct report within a particular period of time, then all bets are off and, you know, they can go after him legally. But, right. I mean, this is something which I think the, the negotiators would have to be cognizant of because I, I certainly would agree with you that if there is no, if there's nothing to prohibit him from continuing with this, then, you know, I, I, I don't think that he will. But I do feel that he understands the reality that he's facing. And as I said, in the same way that Abu Bakr understood the reality that he was facing back in 1990, and you are familiar with Trinidad and Tobago, um, when, when, you are, when you start a coup, ultimately you have to finish it. Because if you don't finish it, that then is off with your head. What it did is it gave, it gave Abu Bakr the opportunity to say, instead of shooting everyone in the Red House, and myself included, I could as well say, well, let me see if I can walk out and I can fight my battles in court. I spent a few years in prison, maybe, but ultimately I get the amnesty. And, and I think Good that point. that's the kind of logic that could very well appeal to these two guys because they're finished. I mean, I, I don't see how they're going to get work in Guyana again. Mm -hmm. You know, um, <laughs> this, this is, the, is the end of the lane. Peter, let me, let me put this back for your contemplation, please. So mm -hmm. in, uh, let's just go back five years. In 20, the PPP lost the elections and they were mm -hmm. about 
25 to 30,000 people in this country, swing voters, that voted the PNC after the into office. And part of that was an expectation that those who were engaged in corruption would have been dealt with. Yeah. It didn't happen. In mm -hmm. fact, corruption got even worse under the incumbent. And so voters, uh, you know, voters became concerned. If, 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 if it mm -hmm. thinks only for one side and it doesn't for the other side, then something has to be really be wrong because more wealth was flowing on the other side. Let's go back to them then. So, but the, my point is that the general balance of things then <coughs> change. Doesn't change mm -hmm. because we keep, uh, I mean, uh, forgiving for, for the sake of moving on. But I do take your point. To, to move on, we might need to make these hard decisions. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a conversation that comes up in Antigua in 2004 when there was a change of government from the ABLP. You know, people were out for blood. Uh, I've seen it in, in St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, 2015. People wanted to see somebody go to prison in Barbados in 2008 when the government elections were, when the government was changed. That was the view. The view was the same thing in 2018. You know, people want to see people being locked up. I understand that part of the narrative is that, but I always say to people, there's a reason why there's a New Testament. I don't know if you guys are into the Bible. I certainly am not. But at the same time, I always argue that the New Testament was written for a reason. And I mean, part of the, the, the reason for me, uh, even as a non-believer, is that it gives you an opportunity to turn in the other cheek, carry some benefits for you as well to move on in relation to issues. Vengeance is expensive. It's expensive financially, and it's expensive emotionally for a country. And I, right. I do feel that it's something that you have to convince your supporters of, because I do believe that the average uh, the average PPP supporter is not going to be comfortable with this idea. And as you said, they're voting because there's an expectation that you're going to lock up some people. Um, the, the, the problem is that to do that in many instances is emotionally expensive for a country, especially a country that is racially polarized like, like Guyana. So yeah. you would have some work to do to convince your supporters that while we are going to pursue some things, if you want to pursue contracts, if you want to pursue those things and whatnot, we can do that, but let's try and see if we can carve out a space here that allows us to move on as a country with, with some level of, um, of decency in, in, in tact. So, but you, you would have your work cut out for you, I mean, presuming that something like this would happen. And mm -hmm. presuming, if, if I may, if I may, um, yo, mm -hmm. uh, gentlemen, good, good evening. Um, let's assume that they decide to fire uh, uh, Kit Lowenfield tomorrow. How, what are the possibilities of him going to court to put a, another stay on this entire proceedings? Who's going to take that? Should I jump in? Hmm. Uh, anybody? <laughs> well, it's probably yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I don't hmm. know if Field will want to go to court to do anything. Right. Um, but somebody else can go to court. But what we what we did in 1999, when the the Article 226 was recommended by the Constitution Reform Commission. Was it was anticipated? Two things were anticipated. One, well, one thing was anticipated, and two things were done. It was anticipated that someone will make an effort or efforts to obstruct the work of the Elections Commission. Because remember, in 1999, we had just come out of rigged elections from 1992, and things like Elections Commission were manipulated and all of that. And the elections, uh, the structure of the Elections Commission was legislated in the Constitution in 1993, I believe. So this was all very new. Um, so in 1999, we recognize exactly what is happening today, that people will manipulate uh, legally to obstruct the work of the commission. So we did two things. We fixed the, the possibility of there being, of, of, we fixed the possibility that a quorum would always be present. So that if somebody left, if a party left the commission, mm -hmm. uh, 
you can reinstitute a quorum by not, by uh, manipulating the numbers. So right. a quorum of the commission was two on one side, two on the other side, and chair. If three mm -hmm. members left, you had a quorum couldn't be established. So what you had was the chair right there on the other side, refix the meeting, and if they don't show up, then you have a quorum with one side and the chair. So that was fixed. The other problem was persistent court action to stop the commission from doing its work. So to answer Orin's question, to answer the question which was um, Leonard's question, is that there is a what we call an ouster clause, not a finality clause like mm. the one that was litigated that preventing appeals, but an ouster clause that prevents court action. So once the commission or any officer is performing duties of the instructions on the commission or the commission is performing its lawful duties, those decisions cannot be um, uh, uh, cannot be litigated in court. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's court action is out of the question now. Right. So either Lowenfield, though I, I doubt whether he will, but any other agency, any other person or agency who might be tempted to take court action to stop the commission from performing its duties will be faced with this problem. They can't go to court. It's not that they can't appeal. They just can't go to court. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Orin, you wanted to say something on that regard? Yes, uh, in, in response to the learned counsel, the whole legal yeah. structure around the Ghana Elections Commission invites dysfunction, and that mm -hmm. thing needs to go as a matter of urgency. Mm -hmm. The problem mm -hmm. we have had in Ghana for decades is that whichever party assumes power, and this is an accusation I level at both of them, soon becomes comfortable with the status quo, and they're happy to operate within it because it benefits them, it advantages them to too great an extent. Mm -hmm. It is too politicized. I would like to see a, a statutory body that has no political influence whatsoever, no opposition <laughs> or government communities. Mm -hmm. A statutory mm -hmm. body that is comprised of technocrats. Good luck trying to find neutral ones in Guyana, but a, a statutory body that is comprised of technocrats that are elections experts and mm -hmm. expected to deliver. Like I said, good luck finding neutral people. Right. But right. that conceptually is what GCOM should be and that conceptually is what GCOM is not. So Correct. what it does, it, it, it hamstrings. Where mm -hmm. there is clear skullduggery afoot and people know the system to a T and know how to move and operate within it with, with bad intentions, it, it, it hamstrings, in my view, the ability of the chair to act and act decisively. So we have Justice Singh, and she is what I would describe as a proceduralist. Mm -hmm. She is a very careful, risk-averse person, somebody mm -hmm. with legal training, a very careful, risk-averse person who does, who does not want to step outside of certain lines. Mm -hmm. She knows that if she fires the referee, as some people are calling for her to do with Mr. Loinfield, she knows that if she fires the referee to get the score that she desires, that is a bad look procedurally. And mm -hmm. as much mm -hmm. as he is, in the view of a lot of people, inviting his own termination, um, she is loath to do that. In no other line of work would you see insubordination to such a degree and, and the individual remains in place. Why is that? Because the whole legal structure around the Guyana Elections Commission invites mischief and mm -hmm. it invites dysfunction. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, Peter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I like Oren's analysis in, in the final part where he talked about the reasons why she will be hard pressed to dismiss him. And I, I, I think that that may very well be the case that being a risk averse person, as you said, if you fire the, the referee to get the score that you want, it looks bad. 
Um, mm -hmm. Where I have difficulty is the suggestion that the DCOM is more dysfunctional than any other elections commission anywhere in the Caribbean. Um, the reality is that the GCOM is comprised of professionals who are technocrats in the true sense of the word and election experts. I mean, you don't have to look further than Keith Loinfield, who, to the best of my knowledge, is one of the most knowledgeable and experienced persons regarding elections in Guyana. Uh, mm. Mingo himself was, was a person that has had uh, a long history in, in this business. And, you know, there are others in there. So the, the idea that the Guyana Elections Commission is comprised differently to the Barbados Elections Commission or the St. Kitts and Nevis or Trinidad and Tobago, um, mm. they're, all, they're all the same. They all have the same structure regarding the commissioners and so on. Um, the difference is that there's nowhere else in the Caribbean that you will find commissioners being as political as this and that you will find an elections officer. We have supervisors of elections in all the Caribbean territories and I've never seen a supervisor of elections behave this way. Um, right. In St. Kitts and Nevis recently, we had a situation where the supervisor, he didn't change the results, but he just said, I'm tired and I'm not calling any more results tonight and he left and he went home. Um, right. My understanding is that his intention was probably not to have restarted, but again, it was difficult because the cameras were on him or whatnot. People knew what the results were um, based on the, the um, counts in the constituencies. It was just a question of declaring it centrally. The, the great thing about the Guyana system is that because you have counts at locations and you have this statement of poll posted, it essentially precludes uh, a chief elections officer from doing exactly this because he's declaring what people already know. And essentially, the check has worked in, in a sense because he's been caught out by virtue of the fact that he's calling out information that people had from the actual areas and they knew what was there and they were able to say, well, look, this isn't making sense. So I, I don't believe it. I mean, I, I hear suggestions that they need to have root and branch reform and they need to get independent people. Look, look how long it took to get Justice Singh. And mm -hmm. the framers of the Guyana Constitution, you know, in their own, in their own um, judgment, uh, came up with this idea that the chairman should be nominated by the opposition and chosen by the um, president. That was something which the, um, the CCJ uh, agreed was uh, a good institution that helped to create balance. And I think it has paying dividends now, but it took, it took ages. So my question is, if you were to choose more people in that way, I mean, we would be at it for, for a long time. And my sense is that it isn't really a problem of the system. The problem is that the professionals of Orange is speaking of, we have them. The problem is that the professionals have gone rogue because they are paying more attention to whatever allegiance they may have, um, probably the, based on the color of their skin, than they are to, to, to a reality that is, is, is there before them. I mean, we also have to raise some serious concerns about the, the judgments that we, we have had from the Court of Appeal. And, you know, um, there were two judgments which were, in my opinion, unquestionable. The first one, related to this, this mass with the, the, the half of 65, which yeah. you know, was a bit of a, a muddle to me. And, and the second judgment was this whole idea that you could have jurisdiction to decide on something that had not already been, to review something that had not already been done. Um, but in both cases, you had that. And, and I'm saying that here you have uh, an independent institution comprised of people who are legally trained and certified and, and you know, of, of the highest re repute um, and you have judgments that are coming out that are questionable. So I, I don't really know that there is a lot of capacity to go further. I think what we really need to do is to look at the quality of people and, and perhaps make a check. As I said, it happened in St. Kitts, but there was logic and sanity brought to the situation largely because the, the prime minister conceded. Um, my feeling is that that's the missing link here. Had President Granger conceded a long time ago, we wouldn't be in this mess. But right. I am not inclined to think that we can do much better regarding the professionalism. Gotcha. So let, let's talk a little bit. <laughs> Councillor, I want to come to you on this one. A little bit of real polity. Now, as of today, as of yesterday, from no other source than the social media page of Brigadier David Granger, there were two extremely amazing statements made. One, to say that Joe Singh was the army officer in charge of the time when the ballot boxes had to be taken to Camp Ghana, And the other was to accuse Carl Morgan as being the, ar the army officer 
that would have been in charge at the time that those boys were killed during the 1973 elections. Now, on one hand, to raise that 1973 uh, killing, I believe, is a little bit inciting at this stage of the sensitive nature of Guyana's history. Um, the other stage is if this man is, is now pointing fingers to his former colleagues in the army, he had five years in office that he could have brought court action and could do a commission of inquiry to investigate them. Over to you, counsel. Well, I don't know why they are attacking these military people. I figured that Joe Singh has come under attack because he wrote a letter in the newspapers um, yes. calling for this, you know, the government to accept the results of the elections and to hand over to a new government, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Now, Joe Singh, as Orin might know, I'm not too sure if Peter is aware, Joe Singh mm -hmm. is a guy with a great deal of credibility in Guyana. Um, Joe said he's never voted just to maintain his neutrality. <laughs> so he's of great credibility with respect from all sides. So I figure that is why they're attacking Joe. I don't know why they're attacking Carl Morgan. Carl Morgan has, is, is in peaceful and quiet retirement. He's not engaged in any political activity of any sort. So I have no idea of why they're attacking Carl Morgan. Uh, he's never been political. Uh, he's not political now. So I don't know. I, I can't answer that question. This is just, this is just weird. <laughs> What, what's going on? I mean, you know, Joe was the chairman of the Elections Commission. And I sat with, I sat under his chairmanship up to, I did several elections and the 2001 was the last. And Joe right. Singh was the chairman for that commission. Well, well, indeed, Council, I'll tell you this, that Granger, I think three weeks ago, he seemed to have been incensed that Joe Singh would have said, call off your dogs of war and concede these elections. Um, because on another uh, discussion he had on one of his private media channels, he would have said, he would have repeated those words that it was Joe Singh who talking about dogs of war and stuff like that. Um, a bit of childishness, I think, but coming from, from somebody who holds the constitutional office of the president of Guyana, it was amazing. Now, counsel, the reason I raised- Well, remember, if I may interrupt you, remember sure. that the Bitterness with Joe Singh goes far back mm -hmm. because Desmond Hoyt, when he was president, bypassed Granger, who was senior to Joe Singh. He bypassed Granger and appointed Joe Singh chief of staff. You must remember that. Right. And Granger, Granger was appointed, Granger was taken to the office of the president and given a sinecure of security advisor from which he spent, from which he re retired, you know, very shortly thereafter. So um, Granger has a great deal of reason to be, to be not happy with Joe Singh. Right. And in addition, counsel, just, just for the sake of record, um, it, it was also the same Granger that would have been on a list in a previous go PPP government of a likely candidate for GCOM chairman, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He was mentioned, yeah, sure. Hey. Anyway, Peter, I want to bring the, the, the geopolitical scenario back to you, sir. You are the best, and, and Orin, of course, um, in terms of let's talk about what's happening with the Caribbean vis-a-vis -vis Guyana. Now, a little while back, the, the, um, Mr. Rowley would have said that he doesn't have a good feeling for how this thing is going to end in Guyana. And since then, I rather believe that nothing more was said from Trinidad's politician's perspective of, of Guyana. I personally believe that it had a lot to do with Trinidad knowing they're going to go to the polls very soon. And, you know, the similarities of Guyana and Trinidad is there. You cannot ignore it in terms of, of the makeup of our peoples and so forth. Uh, Peter, do you think that Trinidad's uh, 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 um, not wanting hesitancy to be more proactive in statements about Guyana might have been relating to their own um, issues there, or is it some other thing that we are not seeing from here? 
I mean, I, I, I wonder because the two countries that have been as forthright in terms of speaking to the matter have been Trinidad and sorry, Barbados and, and St. Vincent being the incoming and outgoing chair. Um, but Trinidad was represented on the, the heads of government group that went down, you know, uh, Prime Minister Rowley yeah. went. Um, he is conscious of the fact that in Trinidad and Tobago, there are also racial divisions there. Um, but I also feel that on a broader level, all of the leaders of the Caribbean are slightly concerned that other chief elections officers may want to exercise similar levels of discretion and they could plunge a country into similar problems. So um, I, I am not sure that there's anything sinister behind Rowley not saying anything further because I think that he expected to be going into an election and right now his mind is focused elsewhere. But I, I do feel that, you know, there, there has to be something to be said about the fact that none of the leaders right now have rushed to, to President Granger's defense, none of them. Um, while all of them haven't been speaking, none of them have broken ranks and rushed to his defense and said, look, um, you know, leave, leave the gentleman and let him take over leadership. Uh, we think that he won the election fair and square or anything like that. So that, that to me is the bigger, the bigger factor. Right. And Oren, uh, starting with you and then coming right back to Peter on this point, let's talk a little bit about economics and oil. Um, you know, Trinidad and the rest of the Caribbean sometime last year, year before, would have started to look to Guyana with great interest as the place of potential, as the place that will start to drive Caribbean business, so to speak. Um, there has been a lot of investment and investment talk from a Trinidad perspective, um, investment in Guyana. Um, however, now, uh, in terms of, of your own feel, how would that have set back um, investors and, and, and finance people from Trinidad and the rest of the Caribbean where Guyana is concerned? If you'll indulge me for a minute before okay. I answer the question, I, I, I want to address a point that yourself and senior counsel were discussing. Sure. Which was uh, some of the postings on the president's uh, Facebook page. Perhaps Donald Trump, President Trump, in the United States has made us all numb to the question of decorum and, and, and how a president uh, presents his social media imagery. But I, my immediate thought when, I, when I've looked at the president's Facebook page in the past week or so, was that President Granger should fire the 21-year-old work-study student who is clearly managing his page because there's a lot of puerile stuff uh, being posted there that does the standing and the dignity of his office no favors. So I think a new approach needs to be taken and uh, that approach to social media postings uh, needs to be revisited. I say this because I, I doubt that the president himself but Orin, has the time or perhaps the ability to make postings of that. But Orin, not any, none of the younger people would have known what would have been Joe Sings and Carl Morgan's assignment during That's, the day. Exactly. They, 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 they're being the, the, the people responsible for the president's social media presence are clearly being, you're right, they're, they're clearly being fed the, the, the information, but the bigger point is the is the puerility of the stuff. It, it it looks it looks puerile. It looks juvenile. It looks undignified. And this is the president of the of the Cooperative Republic of Ghana. And one way or another, he needs to get a grip on 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 his Facebook page and his social media presence because it 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 lowers the it lowers the level of the office of the president in my view. And I feel right. Very about that. Okay. But to your question about oil and in, in investment. Trinidad and Tobago is an hour away from Guyana by mm -hmm. aircraft. And where I live is the repository of a ton of professional expertise in oil and gas. And I think on the last time I was on your, your program, I said that from a CARICOM perspective, I am a regionalist. And if Guyana is, with her newfound wealth, is able to jumpstart, to properly jumpstart the, the, the process of being able to work wherever in the Caribbean we wanted, provided we possess the skills, 
that would be a great thing. I would much rather see a bunch of Trinis marching around Georgetown than no, with, all, with, with all due respect to, to Texans, than a bunch of Texans um, doing the same. If Guyana is able to give life to the CARICOM project in that way, I am all for it. Um, the, the, the business of the past four months or so has necessarily sort of frozen things in place because who is going to enter into an agreement with the, with, with the government, with the current government, right. knowing at this time, knowing that that agreement might be legally dubious or could be overturned. So this has had a, this has had a destabilizing effect in that way. And Peter mentioned the fact earlier in the program that the, that the government is about to run out of money. So mm -hmm. this instability is costly in, in, in terms of investments, but things should start back, things should start back pretty quickly um, once we are, once we are over the impasse. I was in mm -hmm. Guyana last year and I made a joke to a friend that you could barely swing an elbow in the Marriott without hitting a Trini in town to do business. And um, mm -hmm. the level of interest is there, but things are necessarily frozen in place All right. because, of the, because of the political instability we're undergoing at the moment. Thank you. So um, Peter, I, I wanna bring a political question at you. We, we ran a poll and, and for specific reasons, you would know, of course, um, 100, 101 persons were actually polled. Um, some of the, the questions were varied, but 73% of the per, per respondents, 73% of the respondents felt that Granger will not accept a result that the PPP has won. 73% of persons believe that Granger will find a way to stay in office. Mr. Political scientists, <laughs> what do you have to say to such uh, a, a lack of confidence? Um, I, I think that the, I think the analysis is a bit, um, well, they think that we have it the wrong way around. I, I don't know President Granger as well as you guys, but I, I met him on more than one occasion. And I always got the impression that President uh, Granger would not be the person that would be in the front line of fighting this thing. Private mm -hmm. President Grange is not a low and feel or a mingo. Um, so my sense is that if he had his way, he probably would have accepted the results a long time ago and he would have gone quietly into retirement. Like mm -hmm. Frendel Stewart in Barbados and like Tillman Thomas, because those are the three people who I have always thought were similar in terms of their approach to politics across the region. You have Frendel Stewart, Tillman Thomas, and, and President Granger. Um, both Frendel Stewart and Tillman Thomas were beaten badly. Uh, badly enough that they couldn't raise a fuss. Um, President Granger, to me, wasn't beaten so badly that he couldn't raise a fuss, but I think that he was beaten to the point where there, there were possibilities that it could have been raised by somebody else. So my, my feeling is that the problem isn't him. I think that left to himself, he probably would accept it, and I feel that he would have accepted it a long time ago. I mean, I'm not on the ground in Guyana, but I've heard rumors that he had already packed his office and he was ready to move. But mm -hmm. you have some hardliners in there that are saying, don't even think about it. So I think that your 73% of people who were polled are speaking to the, the foot soldiers that are guarding the, the presidential uh, palace or the presidential mm -hmm. office with the view to saying that if you give up, do you realize that you expose people like the same low and Mingo and you expose hundreds and thousands of other people who are relying on you to keep them in power. Mm -hmm. There's a perception among Afro-Guyanese that if the PPP civic gets into office, that they will suffer, they will not be able to live, they will not get any of the wealth that is being generated. And mm -hmm. certainly that 73% is speaking to those people and trying to understand why those people feel that way. Now, my sense is that Dr. Ali has a job mm -hmm. and he has to also be assuring people like that that they have nothing to worry about. But outside of that conversation, I, I, I think that people have, and, and probably with good reason, concerns about their own well-being. And that's mm -hmm. the reason why 
PPP support, PNC supporters are hunkered down and saying that they're not going to let this happen because they feel that they're not going to live without it. Um, I have seen some extremely reasonable people in Guyana, some very good friends of mine, are intelligent people, you know, um, who have a handle on things and whatnot, that, that have stopped speaking to me over this fiasco, yeah. who have taken some very hard line positions. And what they're telling me is that, Peter, we like you, but you do not understand what life will be like for us under the PNC. We cannot let them in office. And I'm right. saying, but this conversation isn't about letting somebody in office. This conversation is about understanding the risk of taking who won or who lost an election. Right. That's simple. All right. there, there clearly is a narrative there that is scaring the daylight out of people who happen to look like myself and Orin. And, 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 and you know, certainly you have to spend a lot more time speaking to persons like, like, like us about what the future will be. And my sense is that Granger is probably the easier target. He is probably one of the easiest people to convince that they have to leave office. The challenge is that you have have people like like Joe Harmon and, and, and um, like they said, the same Mingo and so on. Those are mm -hmm. the ones that are going to say, but, but buddy, you can decide that you're going to just concede defeat and you leave us out here exposed when we've been fighting this, this thing in the trenches. And, right. and that's the challenge. Yes, yeah. yes, indeed, indeed. Senior, mm -hmm. senior counsel. Um, so you on the same point, a lot of the people out there, 74% of the persons feel that uh, even if Claudette Singh were to announce that, uh, that Air Finale wins tomorrow, um, that Granger will uh, find a place. You have heard what Peter's, uh, Peter's uh, impressions and thoughts are on this point. What are your thoughts, Senior, on that likelihood? And also, um, in, you have known a lot of these players. I'm not calling you old, sir, but you... You have certainly been there and you have been around the block and you know a lot of these players. Senior, why don't you pick up this phone and call your, your old buddy Joe and say, Joe, give it up, I lose this election. Well, I, 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 I'm, 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 more, I'm more in the league of, uh, I'm more in the league of David Granger than Joe Harmon. Uh, Joe Harmon, is, <laughs> Joe Harmon is, is younger than I am. Um, but I am, I agree with Peter in his in his analysis of these players, uh, and I know David Granger very well, and I've known him for a long time. We're not friends, but we work together in a committee um, that Hoyt and Jagme had set up a long time ago. He's a very mild mannered gentleman, and, and they, yeah. what people are saying is that the 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 the, the David Granger that is now um, revealing himself is the real David Granger and not the David Granger that we used to know. But in fact, I understand there was a meeting at some time a few weeks back at State House where they discussed the future. And uh, David Granger, among others, uh, decided, felt that uh, the time was ready for them to give up. But some others, including Joe Harmon, said, no, they have a legal argument and some some of them said, "Well, okay, if you have a legal argument, proceed with it. We'll 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 sit by and watch the legal argument." Mm -hmm. And that it is said that accounts for when Kimaraj Ramjatan went to the his ministry and said goodbye to his staff and said that they clearly on the, on in the recording that the PVP had won the election by fifteen thousand votes. And after the action was filed, he changed his tune completely and said, no, no, no. He's only saying goodbye because he was going to a different location to be prime minister. So, um, so there must be some dissension. There must be some uh, continuing discussion in the, in, the, in the leadership of the APNU AFC coalition as to what they will do. And there must be some... Um, varying voices as to what the future holds. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if Claudette Singh is conversant, is aware of what is going on, but she seemed to be taking some very weird positions. God, the pressure on her is very strong to remove uh, Lewinfield, and she hasn't done so. Instead, she did a maneuver. I don't know how lawful it is. She did a maneuver to cancel out the, the, um, the election results, which were 
the declarations which were made to the commission by low and field. So they have only one set of results now, the reconc results. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what could stop either low and field or, or a substitute to say, these are the reconc results, but we're taking out 100,000 votes or 115,000 right. votes that, that Mr. Harmon said were tainted. And you go back over the same procedure. Mm -hmm. What Peter, Peter said something that was very interesting a, a little while back. Mm -hmm. And that is they're running out of money. Now, it might become, if this, if this process goes on for much longer, you might begin to have action by the OAS, CARICOM, and others. Um, CARICOM has no procedure as far as I know. The OAS has procedures. But CARICOM at the head of government meeting can... Uh, can be called ahead of government meeting can be called at any time and suspend uh, suspend Guyana from CARICOM. If those things begin to happen and then they have difficulty in finding money to run the country, then we're entering into a very dangerous position. Either they have a coup of some sort because they have to call parliament uh, to vote monies. Mm -hmm. So, um, or vote a budget uh, to get funds to, to get funds to manage the government either right. either by some unlawful means or just shut down the whole country and have a, a, a military type uh, style uh, uh, regime so they have to the time is coming when they have to decide what future they want either right. to give but in allow the results to be announced or, you know. Granger would have been on air recently um, saying that, that, you know, whatever talks about sanctions they are, that I, his government has done nothing wrong. They have not, he is claiming they have not interfered with GCOM. They didn't do anything. G, they're waiting on GCOM's declaration. So, so um, would, would any action from OAS or CARICOM or so be, uh, um, you know, not, not necessarily the right thing to do until the government is, is held uh, found to be not in compliance. Well, Granger's not fooling anybody. I mean, he's not fooling the <laughs> Americans. Pompeo has issued mm. instructions to his staff to start the process of holding them accountable. The mm -hmm. OAS has started the process. The OAS has to order a, an investigation. Um, and very soon we'll see other people starting the process. Unless mm -hmm. this week, Unless Claudette Singh, well, mind you, we say that every week, but unless Claudette Singh somehow manages to get a declaration made this week, I think we're going to see people taking action against the government. And if okay. I may, if and, I may. And they will have uh, to decide what to do. Uh, there is this statement coming out from the OAS sector, then general today, this is Louis Amago. And they, they, he's saying that uh, they have written the permanent council of the OAS to have a meeting uh, of, of to discuss Guyana's electoral process, and, and so I want to ask you, what's the import of this meeting? Uh, should Guyana be worried at this point in time, or should the coalition be worried? Well, my brother, who was there for quite a few years, tells me, and on his authority, I'm speaking. He said that um, the what they will do is that the the council the, will the council will appoint a committee to study the Guyana situation, make a report. It's a slow process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll make a report, and then that report will go to the General Assembly. And right. the General Assembly will make a decision, likely to suspend Guyana. Likely, but that's not the only possibility, to right. suspend Guyana. They might do other things, like asking the government to meet a delegation, coming, to, coming down to Guyana to try to persuade the government to change course. All of those things can happen. But one oh, Freddie, other thing that can happen is to mm -hmm. suspend Guyana. Freddie, certainly, Freddie Kisun, who we had here last week, and Peter, I want to come to you and Orin on this. Uh, two things. One is Freddie believes that, um, that that is exactly what the PNC is playing for. They're playing for the paradigm when these brokers are going to come to Guyana to say, okay, here is what. Fresh elections are a must. There's too much problems going on here. 
And so um, we, we, we're going to talk to the PPP. They're going to chop out three years of the PPP's government. And, and we're going to give a determination to the people. So that's one. Two, what money, gentlemen? The country has no money. We have a 90-something billion dollars deficit at the Bank of Guyana. We have no money. We are not going to get the oil money from anytime soon unless a legitimate government. So I, see, I don't know what he's calling parliament for or what his military rule is going to do. What money? The truth is that sanctions have already started. We cannot get any gold money. We cannot get any oil money. We cannot get any of these funds repatriated to Guyana. And thirdly, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but we're getting to that point at the, at the program. Thirdly, Pisa, you, you, you did rightly point to, to the concerns about, about racial balance and inequities. However, a lot of people feel in Guyana that PPPC has more of every other race, albeit dominated by one, has more of every other race than the PNC has of the other races. Is that the case or is that the perception? That may be the truth. I think that, that and I, I heard, I heard um, uh, Mr. Nandilal say uh, in another program last week that in order to win the kind of numbers that you have, clearly you have a, a diverse um, yeah. offering. And, and there's no question about that. I think the perception though, especially the perception among the minds of um, PNC supporters is, is a very different reality. APNU, they, they are, those supporters are not convinced of that. And, and in, in this business, the perception is usually a greater problem than the reality. So the perception is still something that you have to deal with. Um, you know, the points on the, uh, the OAS and so on is very interesting. Um, one of the things that I'm fascinated by is the fact that the OAS, OAS has not been able to take a unified position on Venezuela, um, which has been a, a big irritant to numbers of members in the OAS teams. They have however been able to take a unified position on Guyana. And you know, I, I remember Prime Minister Gonzalez said it's frightening because he has not heard the United States speak with the same voice as St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Barbados, Trinidad, Jamaica, um, speak with one voice in relation to an issue for a long time. Uh, and, and certainly the OIS is united in that position. So the fact that they have started, as you said, it's a slow process and I, I appreciate that it will take a long time. But it does send a signal that you know, the future is not going to be bright. I, I don't see the idea of cutting down a term to three years. Um, I don't believe that we're in that type of negotiation. And I think that um, certainly the PPP civic would be hard pressed and I would be very surprised if they were saying, you know, we will shorten our term any, any, any more than we already have uh, by virtue of the fact that we've had this 100 days taken off to, to call an election sooner because somebody decided they wanted to go rogue. No, I'm not seeing it. Right. All right. Mm. We're forgetting the Commonwealth in this process. Yeah. And uh, mm. I think that, okay, we're, we're in the America's hemisphere and we have this mm. geographical relationship with the Organization of American States. But I think, uh, based on the fact that I've sort of covered Commonwealth affairs for the better part of 20 years, I think that our associ Guy Guyana's association with that body is actually stronger than its association with the OAS. And the incredible thing about the, the various views is the degree to which they have been completely in lockstep um, when, it, when it comes to Guyana and, and, and this electoral process. Um, Yogi raised the possibility of CARICOM suspending Guyana, um, which would be interesting given that the headquarters Exactly. Um, it's just outside of Georgetown. That'll be an interesting state of affairs were it to happen. I mm -hmm. somehow doubt that it would actually come to that because CARICOM has been dealing with rogue electoral issues or rogue electoral players in Guyana for decades. Mm -hmm. And right. they have in the past tended to be very soft on mm -hmm. Guyana. So it was refreshing to hear the outgoing chair and the incoming chair speaking so robustly in defense of principles of good governance um, in Ghana. I know they've been they, they've both been demonized mm -hmm. by supporters of APNU plus AFC, but it was it was refreshing to hear them speaking right. in, in, in such robust defense of Ghana. Now to, to a question that was discussed, the question before a little bit earlier. 
um, about whether Grain, uh, President Granger is leading events or being buffeted by them. I've gone back and forth on this question, but in the end, I've settled on agreement with Peter. And the thing that made me settle on agreement was watching him in the immediate aftermath of the CCJ decision um, come outside of his official residence to address the crowd. Mm -hmm. I saw something in his body language which suggested, and his interaction with that crowd. He was surrounded by his own security as if he needed protecting from the crowd. And within the crowd itself was embedded a lot of policemen and women. I saw something in his interaction with that crowd that told me that the president is no longer in charge of that narrative. His interaction with the crowd was half-hearted and, 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 and almost forced. Now, it does raise questions about his leadership abilities, given the fact that he used to be the most high-ranking person in Guyana's army. It does raise question about his leadership abilities if he is allowing himself to be buffeted by events rather than leading on things. But I, I, I've, come to, I've come around to agreeing with Peter's point of view on that. I know that I've diverted slightly, but I, I, yeah, yeah. I had a no, point that I wanted to make. It's uh, an interesting paradigm. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting paradigm. And I want to bring it, uh, Peter, for your comment, because is, and these are just my words, is the, the brigadier now the bridesmaid, or as, as, or as um, Mr. Senior Counsel said, is this the real Granger standing up now? Yeah. No, I, I, I like Orange's analysis. Um, if he led the Guyana army, bear in mind that a person who leads an army invariably doesn't lead an army on account of charisma. A person who leads an army leads an army on account of the institutional structure that says you follow orders. Um, and it's interesting because when I look at the other two leaders I compared him with, which is Fernando Stewart in Barbados and Tillman Thomas in, in Grenada, right. both of them led in a way that suggested that they rely on the fact that their instructions would be followed. Um, I'm not saying that he's bereft of charisma, but he's not the most charismatic person. I mean, I, I can think of any number of people who were more charismatic than him that could have left the APNU, led the APNU AFC. Um, certainly, uh, when I would have done polling for, for that grouping, uh, or should I say when I would have done polling, people don't ever discuss my client's identity in the past, President Granger's name was not exactly high on the list of, of options until such time as he actually became the leader of the group. And then you know, everyone was like, oh, okay, well, if he's leading, we'll support him. But it wasn't as though he came to the front in that way. So I don't know that he is the necessarily the person that people would be able to go and address a crowd and, and rally them and so on. He relied on the institutional support. And as Orin is saying, the institutional support seems to be falling away from him. And you know, it is as almost though when I heard him make that speech outside, it sounded as though someone called him and said, okay, this is what you need to have to say. This is the narrative and you go and you carry it. He didn't right. carry it with any passion. You know, I agree. It didn't seem to come from within. It sounded as though someone called him and said, you know, you go and say this. And he went out there and said this. I mean, how could anybody listen to that CCJ judgment? That thing was solid. Yes. And say that it left any confusion as to what the, the justices were saying and so on. And, you know, and then I hear people picking it to pieces and, and that type of thing. And I find it a bit weird because the intelligent person that he is, he heard the CCJ's judgment, he knew exactly what it intended, mm -hmm. uh, it, what it was supposed to be interpreted to mean and what they were expecting to see. Mm -hmm. So I'm with Orin on that one, that I don't believe that he is in full control, that there, there are other people pulling strings and, and making decisions. Thank you. And gentlemen, we are getting down to that time when we'll have to say good night, but I have some, just one more question for you, Senior. Senior, the likelihood that the chairman made tomorrow um, uh, um, have Myers um, take on the mantle of preparing that final report. Uh, there is a feeling, Senior, that Low Enfield cannot be terminated or would not want to be terminated because as long as he's terminated, he loses the protection of GCOM. And that can open the door for anything. Is there a likelihood, Senior, that um, he can be suspended and Myers can then be taken to do the job. And does it have any legal ramifications for him to be so replaced? 
Well, I don't know what his contract of employment provides. I presume he has a contract. And if the contract doesn't provide for suspension, I, I don't think he can be suspended. However, I, I don't get the impression that that is what the chairman is attempting to do. I think despite the overwhelming pressure that is, that is forced, that is being brought to bear against her to dismiss Lowenfield, she appears to have decided that she will uh, pursue the course of seeking a, 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 um, a report from Lowenfield. And if he doesn't give the report, there's some, there's some uh, speculation that he, does, he will not give the report. Mm -hmm. and that she will ask um, Myers to give the report. Well, that that's, if Myers will give the report, well, then that would solve the problem as far as- But does one sense to require the office of the CEO to give the report? Well, if the CEO refuses to give the report, I, I don't know, I don't think there's anything wrong with her asking the, okay. the deputy to give the report. Um, if Myers doesn't give the report, then she, then she has she has to take some steps what steps she will take, I don't know, but she'll have to rethink the situation. But I hope that it comes to an end this week. If we can't, mm -hmm. we can't, the country can't take this for another week. Gotcha, thank you, senior. Oren, mm -hmm. your comments as we tell our, our viewers and listeners, uh, uh, good night. Thought just occurred to me that we're in our Henry Ford moment. <laughs> Remember Henry Ford said you can have whatever color car you want as long as it's black. Is there... <laughs> that is the option that Madam Chair has set Mr. Lowenfield. She has narrowed his, uh -huh. his options to the point where that is all and only that that yeah. I want from you. If that is not a Henry Ford moment, I don't know what is. All right. Um, Peter, mm -hmm. Peter had an interesting analysis earlier in saying that, um, an interesting point earlier in saying that Guyana's Elections Commission is not that different from others in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. But at which other elections commission would the chairman have to insist five <laughs> or six times that her chief elections officer operates within legally prescribed mm -hmm. tram lines? I, 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 I don't know. Perhaps you could help me with that, Peter. And, and this is where I think that the, the legal institutional makeup of, of the Ghani Lectures Commission needs to be seriously, seriously revisited. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that, Aaron. Peter? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I want to agree with Aaron entirely that um, if the Chief Elections Officer in Barbados or Trinidad and Tobago started to behave the way that this gentleman is behaving in Guyana, th there would be a white van positioned outside to take him off to the mental institution. Because this is not something you can get away with in, in most, most um, democratic societies. The fact that it can be pulled off in Guyana speaks volumes about the environment. And perhaps Oren is right that they need a structure, you need a structure, so they, you need a structure that is different that will ensure that something like this cannot happen. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a reasonable, reasonably good point on which to think this is a lesson for the future. And I think in all of this, all of our countries can learn a lot from, from these lessons. Um, I, I, I listen with great interest to Senior Counsel Ram Karan's point, uh, and I hope he is correct that there is a way that the commissioner can order, or the, the, the chairman can order and get what she wants without dismissing, and she can get it from a, a, a secondary person. Um, my layman's reading of it suggests that the constitutions have put the chief elections officers and supervisors of elections in these countries in very peculiar positions because once they're in the field of battle, which is until they actually declare a result, it's very, very difficult to move or change them. And, and, and my sense is that it's that way for a reason. And, you know, I am not sure um, how it works, but I am, I am taking confidence in his legal knowledge of the situation and the belief that uh, certainly in the course of this week, the, the chairman is able to get the black car that she wants uh, using the language of Henry Ford. <laughs> and, and that we can see an end to this. And I really do wish you guys all the best because I do feel that you've had enough of this now. And, and Guyana deserves um, to next week to have a new government in office settle down and get back to business. 
Thank you, thank you. And so ladies and gentlemen, with that, we are going to have a wrap yeah. of our program tonight. Our apologies again for the late start. It was outside of our control. And we do know that tomorrow at 1.30, you'll be under the good hands of Mr. Leonard Gildari on elections. What, Leonard? Yes, sir. Thank you very much there, uh, Dr. Yog Mahadio. And gentlemen, it's been a pleasure listening to you guys on the sidelines here. Uh, but tomorrow is going to be a very critical day. I think um, it comes down. Uh, we've been watching, and you would have seen those letters being issued uh, by the GCOM chair. And I think uh, the last letter that was issued to um, Keith Lowenfield had a finality in its tone um, that I believe it comes down to tomorrow uh, as to whether he runs to the court or attempt to run to the court and whether there is going to be a judge who wants to accommodate. Uh, we don't know as yet because strange things have happened. But join us 1.30 tomorrow for elections. Watch and we're going to bring you those details. Great. Thank you for that, Leonard. And Peter, thank you so much. I know you are, yeah, it's about pleasure. three or four in the morning. <laughs> in France. That's good, though. This, this is important. Don't, Great, don't, don't, don't worry, he's jet lagged. He can't yeah. sleep anyway. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's very true. That is true. Yeah. But you know what? Uh, yeah. Yeah. As a Guyanese, we'll continue yeah. to take um, take advantage of a kindness, Peter. So we'll be calling again. Don't yeah. worry. No problem. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oren, yeah. it's been a pleasure to have you once again, and likewise, we'll call you as we continue. Because after these elections, gentlemen, we got to talk. Guyana has to rejoin the, 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 the intellectual and political and, and economic thinking of the Caribbean. So we got to continue the conversation going. Senior Council, it's been a pleasure to have you, sir. And we certainly look forward to continued discourse with you. And uh, by my colleagues, gentlemen, thank you all so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to have you here in room 592 where we unleash the truth. And tonight's analysis, of course, have been very pointed and it looks at where we are heading. Let's hope for a better day tomorrow. Wherever you're joining us from, do have a great night. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, Guyana is still the best country in the world. And so you can do a prayer for this beautiful country before you go to bed tonight. Have a great night, ladies and gentlemen. Stay safe. God bless you. And God bless this beautiful country of ours, Guyana. Do have a great night. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. COVID-19 tips sponsored by Dexo. One, practice social distancing. Two, Wear your mask when leaving the house. Three, wash your hands regularly for 20 seconds using our deck soap. Four, cover your nose and mouth with a disposable tissue or flex elbow when you cough or sneeze. Choose deck soap for that extra cleanliness. Deck soap is affordable and available nationwide.